Welcome to another edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are going verse by verse through the book of Genesis. And we left off last time in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. So get your Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 6. We'll begin in just a minute. This Scripture Verse by Verse website is something that I remind you of every single broadcast because I'm all about the Word of God. That's what I have been all about for 40 years. Since I was saved 41 years ago, that has been my heart's desire, is to study, learn, and teach God's Word verse by verse, Genesis through Revelation. And you can study with me using my audio Bible messages at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Now, there are four series going through the Bible, 34-plus years of archives from me. Click and listen. You choose where you want to study and click and listen. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's Word. That's all you need at thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Genesis 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, and by the way, every time this term, sons of God, is used, it refers to angels or Jesus Christ, the eternal son of the eternal father, or Christians who are the adopted sons and daughters of God. But in the Old Testament, every single time this phrase is used, it refers to angels without exception. These are angels, fallen angels those who rebelled with Lucifer, totally given over to evil. And it says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So these falling angelic creatures lusted after human women, and they cohabitated with them. And notice verse 3. This is no coincidence that it follows verse 2. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And that's referring to the offspring of this angelic fallen angels and human woman cohabitation. It produced a giant race, a race of giants, I should say, a race of giants who were irredeemable and completely given over to evil like their fathers. And notice, that's why it says what it says. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. In other words, it happened again. It happened again throughout Israel's history in the Old Testament. These giants appeared. So it wasn't the only time. But this was the big one. This is what got it all started. And it also resulted in the total corruption of the human race, with one exception. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, fallen angels, came into the daughters of men, human women, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. They were men of renown. They were huge. They were giants. They were powerful. Not just physically powerful, but powerful to do evil. And they were men of renown. They were half human, half angel to... People back in those days, they were like gods, small g, but they were like gods. They were powerful, men of renown, 
reputation. They were like the celebrities of the day. Five, something else, though. Look at it. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That, my friend, was the end result of this fallen angel, human woman, cohabitation. It produced a race of irredeemable, half-breed, wicked people, so-called, who were totally given over to sin all the time, nothing else. That was it. Some may wonder why God wiped out the whole world with a flood. But you know, he could not have been more patient God waited until this evil spread. It got so bad that it was all bad, all the time, all sinful, all the time. If people were not doing sin, they were planning sin. And this was every moment of their life. Total corruption. So bad that verse 6 says, and it repented the Lord. It sorrowed him. It grieved him. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. The sin of man did not just anger God. It hurt God. Things have really gotten out of control. This was very hard on God. Because sin is the only thing, really, that upsets him. Sin is the only thing that angers him. And the whole world had become sinful, with an exception. Verse 8, we see what it is. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah did not earn favor. He did not work for favor, which is what grace is, but he found it in the eyes of the Lord. You know, compared to the rest of the world, Noah was godly, but of course he was still a sinner and he was still worthy of death. But because of his faith in God and his desire to do right, God will show him favor and spare him from judgment, which is about to come. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Now watch this. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. That's why he was just. Justification was by faith. Back in those days, just like it is today, it's always been justification by faith. It's always been salvation by faith. If you look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Noah is in that chapter of great men and women of faith. He had faith. That's why he was justified. But it says something else about Noah. It says that he was perfect in his generations. Now, we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so it doesn't mean that he was spiritually and morally perfect, but what it does mean is that he was physically perfect. Not, not that he never got a cold or never got the flu or anything like that. It's just that Noah was not corrupted by this race of half-breeds. He had been spared that awful fate. God protected Noah. He was, and it says... It says that Noah was perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. He was the only one, evidently, and his wife and his two sons who were not corrupted by this angelic human cohabitation. Verse 10 and 11. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Well, of course it was. 
when you have people who are totally given over to sin, they will totally be given over to selfishness and destructive behavior. And that would include violence. The earth was a horrible place to live. Not that any of those people noticed. And I use the word people loosely. Notice, I doubt it, they were a part of it. But Noah sure noticed it. And so did his three boys and his wife. And it says here that Noah begat three, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Corrupt means to be changed from good to bad. It's been corrupted. It wasn't made bad, but it became corrupt. You know, if you have a piece of fruit, if you have an orange and you buy it and it's perfectly ripe, well, if you forget about it and you, and you leave it out on your cupboard or whatever, after a while, you're going to notice that there is mold on it. It has become corrupt. And that's what happened to God's creation. When God looked at the earth in Noah's day, it was like sour milk to God, meaning it was once good, but now it was extremely horrible and disgusting to God. It was corrupt, good for nothing. What do you do with sour milk? You throw it out. Hopefully you don't take a taste of it, but you... Throw it, you throw it down the drain because it's worthless. Corrupted milk, sour milk is worthless to you. And this earth had become, and the inhabitants thereof had become totally worthless to God. So there's only one thing to do. 12. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all, fle all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Everyone was totally given over to their sin except for Noah and his family. He was perfect physically and he was justified by his faith. Noah lived for God when it was not a cool idea to live for God. Noah lived for God when it was not popular to say the least. And Noah did not try to blend in with everyone else. We know from the book of Hebrews, he preached the word of God. And we know from the New Testament, I should say, that he preached the word of God to these moral reprobates. 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the eighth earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God is God. And he does what he knows is best. When God determines that something needs to be done, then he does it. He doesn't ask for our permission. He is the king of the universe, the only potentate, the one in charge, all powerful, all knowing, all wise, all holy. When he knows it's time to do something, he will do it. The Bible says that no one counsels God. Of course not. This is God's world, and he does what he must do. And here, he must destroy the world that sin has ruined because the people are not going to change. He gave them 120 years to change, and obviously they were not going to. They were corrupt in every way. The only exception, Noah and his three sons and his wife. So the whole world will be destroyed. God's justice and judgment in action. If you would like to be a part of this ministry, pray for me. Pray for God's word. When you take a break from studying at the thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Join me. Let's get out God's word together in this straightforward way without watering it down. The whole counsel of God, as I have been doing for over 34 years. You know I'm not going to do anything different. I never have, and I never will. Until next time, so long.